Okay, uh, you know how we, we do. We're going to kind of catch up real fast, and then we'll carry on where we were. Uh, we are in the fourth and final section of exhortation, interjection of exhortation. Uh, the way I'm, I'm understanding the book of Hebrews is you have this exposition on the, the person of Jesus Christ, and then in that lengthy exposition, you have interjected sections of exhortation, and I've pointed those out as we've gone through. This is taking from uh, basically uh, George Guthrie's uh, understanding of, of the f- structure of the book, and we're in the, the last uh, hortatory interjection, the last interjection of exhortation, which runs from chapter 10, verse 26, through chapter 13, verse 19. And in chapter 11, we see that the writer presents the positive example of faithful people in history. You know, the great roll call of faith, we call it. But he goes in and he's doing that for a reason because you remember the circumstances. He's writing to Christians who are in danger of turning back to some form of Judaism. And they are doing that, probably they're getting pressure in a number of ways. They're having, they're, they're being ostracized by Jewish family members. So you can see that creates a lot of pressure. But they're also... Uh, facing pressure from the state. We are, if the reconstruction I've, I've offered to you is accurate, we're at the verge of the Neronian persecution. It hasn't broken out yet, but it's there, and you can see all these the, the straws in the wind of hostility of the state toward the Christian faith. And so you're a person here in, in Rome, and you're sitting here thinking, I'm getting ostracized by the Jewish community, I can't get a decent job, they're looking down on me, my family members won't have anything to do with me. Now I've got the state rattling its saber and, and you know, making noises about persecuting. This Jesus thing is starting to, you know, the cost of this is starting to add up. And so there is this temptation to abandon Christ and to go back to some form of Judaism. So he, in chapter 11, he, he appeals to these great heroes of faith to get people to say, listen, do you see that here are people who trusted in the unseen, they trusted in the promise, and they remained faithful and conducted themselves in this world because they knew what God had said. And he goes through and gives some great examples. He speaks of the faith of of, uh, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. He speaks of the faith of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The faith of Moses' parents, of Moses, of the Israelites, the faith of Rahab, And then near the end, he speaks of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And he refers to martyrs uh, and faithful Jews from the time of the Maccabean revolt. So he's pointing to these great heroes of faith, and he says that the world judged them as unworthy, the way the world treated them. They're running around hiding in holes. Everybody's after them. They're like the scum of the earth. They're being treated. He says, but the truth of the matter is, the world wasn't worthy of them. See, when the world looks at people and says, the world's judgment isn't the last word, right? God's judgment is, and he says, the truth of the matter is, is that the world was not worthy of them. They were the faithful people of God. They were in the right, and the world was coming down on them. And so he wants these people who are in that position to identify with them, to feel that very same thing. And in verses, uh, chapter 11, verse 39 and 40, he says that despite the fact these heroes of Jewish history were commended as examples because of their faith, none of them received the ultimate goal, okay, a permanent dwelling in a permanent homeland. They were great heroes of faith. Their faith commended them as examples, but none of them received the ultimate goal, And as Donald Hagner noted in that quote that I gave you, God's people of every age, they constitute a unity, and through Christ will together arrive at the perfection of the consummated kingdom, the glory of resurrection life in a redeemed creation. And so together, we will, as a unit, we will arrive at that glory. Then chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he urges the hearers, In light of this great cloud of predecessors that he's been talking about, this great cloud of witnesses whose faith bears witness to the church that God's promises are to be trusted. Right? I mean, that's how they lived, right? I mean, you could see if you're standing on the outside looking at these people, you're saying, why are you doing that? Why are you living that way? Why are you enduring this? And their answer would be because God has said something and I'm living in faith in that promise. 
And so they bear witness to the church that God's promises are to be trusted. So he tells them in light of that great cloud of witnesses, he tells them to run with endurance the race that is before them. With endurance. You see, every Christian has a pull on them, and we are called to carry that, to run with it, to stick with it. Not to abandon the faith when the going gets tough. Run with endurance the race uh, set before you. That's what they're called to do. And this involves laying aside every weight, everything that burdens you in the running of this race, whether it be fear, whether it be doubt. It involves laying aside the entanglements of sin. Because those things, see, when you have one foot in the world and trying to run the race, you're all wrapped up. It makes running the race very difficult. But it also involves fixing our eyes on Jesus, who's the ultimate example of endurance. In chapter 12, verse 3, he restates the need to focus on Jesus, who endured the ultimate abuse from sinners. Here are people who are being intimidated, pressured to turn because of how they're being treated in the world. And he says, look at Jesus. Look at Christ. Look what he endured. He endured the ultimate. Look how the world treated him, and yet what did he do? He remained faithful to God through all of it. And so he calls them to do that. Then in chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, he reminds them that, look, unlike Jesus, you have not yet been called to to shed your blood in your struggle against sin, in your struggle to remain faithful. You You haven't been put to that point yet. Jesus was. Okay, but you haven't been put to that point yet. Okay, and so you are called to endure the lesser at this point. You look at him, he endured the greater. If you look at him enduring the greater, you can certainly endure the lesser. I understand you got people who are ostracizing you. I understand it's hard to get a job. I understand all of these things that you're afraid of the state. But he says, look what Jesus endured. Okay, look, so he, he tells them to focus on him. They have not yet been called to shed their blood and their struggle to remain faithful. And he tells them that they need to see their present struggling in a different light. Okay, they need to see their present struggling in a different light. Rather than seeing the mistreatment they were enduring because of their faith as an indication of God's absence or his inattention, they're to see it as God's loving discipline. And thus is a sign that they are truly sons. You see, they are are to convert the difficulties they're experiencing. They're to reframe it. So they see it as a sign of God's love. He's treating them as children, as true children, disciplining them so that then instead of becoming a a basis for wavering in their commitment to God, it becomes a reason to hold all the more strongly to God. So he tells them, see, you need to look at this differently and understand this. Then in chapter 12, verses, uh, verses 12 and 13, that's where we'll pick back up. He says, therefore, strengthen the hands that are drooping And the knees that are weak and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Okay, in verse 12, he calls the hearers to renew their determination to live faithfully for Christ in the face of this spiritual and emotional fatigue that they're experiencing, which spiritual and emotional fatigue he represents in the words drawn from Isaiah 35, verse 3, of drooping hands and knees that are weak. Okay, so he's, this is when he says, therefore strengthen the hands that are drooping and the knees that are weak. He's drawing on Isaiah 35, and he is using that imagery to depict their spiritual discouragement. Okay, this is, he says, strengthen yourself in the face of this spiritual discouragement that you're experiencing. Okay, go ahead, and he calls them then to, uh, to be stronger in the face of that spiritual and emotional uh, fatigue that they're having. Because, you know, when, you, when you've been a Christian for a long time, I've told you before, this friend of mine who said after I don't know how many years, he said, the pixie dust is wearing off. And it was like, you know, when you settle into living a Christian life, year after year, decade after decade. You know, so here they're kind of getting ground down and they've got all these pressures They have this uh, uh, spiritual and emotional fatigue. He sits to these drooping uh, hands that are drooping and knees that are weak. He tells them to be strong. And the call in verse 13 to make straight or level paths for their feet, it's a call for them to choose God's holy way of living 
That's what that is, that description. To make level paths for your feet is to choose God's holy way of living so that the lame, meaning those who've been crippled by spiritual discouragement, will be healed rather than experience the more serious spiritual condition described as being disabled or dislocated. So he says, look, what he's calling them to here, they need to rededicate themselves to living the Christian life. In the face of the pressure, in the face of the temptation, they need to grab themselves and recommit themselves to living the Christian life. Because it's not always easy. Okay? As I've said many times, ad nauseum. It's not always, there's not a bubble. Living the Christian life can be difficult, especially in a world that wants to paint you as a bonehead and as an enemy of the state because you're intolerant. You see, he wants to say, no, 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 you're, you're harming the society because you are intolerant of the things that we want. You're saying there are things that are wrong. You're saying there are people who need to repent. And that upsets people and they don't like it, so you're really causing you know, problems in the culture and the society. And to me, it's not a great leap to go from that to at some point being outlawed for you to preach the truth about people's spiritual condition. Okay, but some think I'm paranoid, but there you have it. Uh, you know, that wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't shock me. But here, in this situation, these people are, are experiencing this, and he says, listen, you need to rededicate yourselves to living the Christian life with all that that entails. Okay, so that entails, you know, gathering with the saints, not being ashamed, living the way you need to live. I understand it's difficult. I understand it's difficult, but you are called to do that. And anybody who's wavering, anybody who's facing these kinds of pressures, we need to call them to that. We need to call them to sit there and say, strengthen the hands that are drooping and the knees that are weak. Devote yourself to God's holy way of living. Commit yourself to doing that so that your spiritual discouragement not deteriorate into a worse condition. Okay? So this is what he calls them to do. Then he says in, in verses 14 to 17, chapter 12, he says, pursue peace with everyone. And pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Take care that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he did not find a place for repentance, though he sought it with tears." See, in, in living the Christian life, he says, they are to pursue peace, harmonious relationships with everyone. In other words, we are not to be people who sit here and say, yeah, you know, this kind of attitude, I hope this comes across. Yeah, you know, who are you? You know, this, this kind of stuff where somebody's messing with you. Yeah, you know, this, this tough kind of uh, ready to fight at the drop of a hat kind of deal. Okay, we are to pursue as much as it depends on us. Okay, we can't guarantee harmonious relationships, right? You can't. But we are to pursue them with everyone so that people who interact with Christians ought to have that sense that we are people of peace who uh, seek harmony. We are not the people who are sitting always ready to fight and all that kind of thing. Okay, but he says, he says in living the Christian life, they're to pursue peace with everyone and are to, are to pursue the holiness that is necessary to see the Lord. You see, without sanctification of life, without a transformed life that's dedicated to God, no one will see the Lord. See, no one will see the Lord in the sense no one will enter the heavenly city. No one will enter into God's presence for eternity. There has to be consecration of life. I have said this from the, you know, throughout the time I've been able to teach. I say it all the time because it's critical in a society and in a world that has taken the Christian faith and wanted to turn it into simply an intellectual belief. Do you believe intellectually that these certain facts are true? Okay, well, that's a good starting point. That's not biblical faith. I must surrender to those facts. Like Jesus says in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You see, there is a difference in simply acknowledging something or getting your mouth to make certain sounds and genuinely saying, this is the truth. I am going to live according to this. If there is no consecration of life, if your confession of faith in Christ doesn't translate somehow into your life, 
Well, then it's just lip service. And this is what he's saying here when he says, listen, you know, without, without holiness, pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So you have people who sit here and live for themselves, live the way they want to, live in sexual immorality, live in all kinds of ways, live in drunkenness, live in these things. And they sit here and say, well, okay, when I go to bed, I just ask Jesus to forgive me because he's the great sin cleanser in the sky. And I'm going to tell you, okay, his word to you would be, you need to repent. You need to come and give me your life because I sit here and I call you to an absolute holiness. I call you to live for me. You give your life up. You come and die, and you live for me. That's my call. You can't compromise it. You can't change it. Okay, now, whenever I say that, I also always want to say to people, you think you're perfect? Of course I don't. You know, I got eyes, ears. I know who I am. I live in here. I know the things I think. I know how self-centered I can be. I know all that. You know, I'm not that dense. But the idea, do you see there is a difference in a genuine pursuit of Christ and failing in that pursuit and an attitude that simply says, frankly, I don't care. I'm just going to live how I want to do. Now, I'll front for church folk. You see, I'll put on for them. But listen, when I go home, it's porno, baby. Okay? It's porno, and I'm holding on to it, and I'm not going to get rid of it, and I'm not going to repent of it. Right? Okay, well, what I'm telling you is God sees all, knows all, has to be a genuine surrender. Okay? I use an example of drug addicts. I do it because I think people relate to it. You can have somebody who says, listen, okay, let's pick somebody who's addicted to heroin. Guy says, listen, I, I see Jesus, I love Jesus, I'm giving him my life. In that commitment. This guy goes somewhere, and what do you know, there's this and that going on. He falls, okay? Well, you see, he then gets up, confesses his sin, and just keeps walking. You see, we can sin in a commitment to Christ, right? I mean, don't we all do that? And so we get up. The key, you have to get up and keep striving for Christ. That's a completely different spirit. So when he says this thing about, he says, without holiness, Uh, with which no one will see the Lord, I think he's speaking of the genuineness of a person's pursuit of Christ, which is an inherent aspect of biblical faith. There is no biblical faith without that. But that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, okay? So he talks about that and he says, listen, we have have to have this holiness without sanctification of life, without a transformed life that is the flip side, it is the other side of the coin of believing Without that, no one will see the Lord. And then he urges the community to take care. Now, this is important. He's writing to the church, and he urges the community to take care, you see, that to take care that none of them turns from the faith so as to miss the grace of God. He puts this responsibility on the group. He says, you guys work. You guys take care to see that none among you, none in your midst, none of you wind up missing the grace of God, that none of you turn from the faith. We have a responsibility to one another. You know, the idea that we can just be little isolated things that come in and come together without being a connected community is not biblical. Okay, you know, I mean, Ray Charles can see it, right? You read the, read the Bible and you see there is a connection. We are bound to one another. And we have a responsibility to one another. And this is what he says here. He tells the community, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. He's urging them to see that none of them turns from the faith so as to miss the grace of God. And then he reinforces that appeal to the church to take effort, to labor, to see that none among in your number miss the grace of God, that they don't turn from the faith. Your responsibility, not only, I understand that, Person who, who turns from the faith, who's going to stand before Christ, isn't going to be saying, yeah, but they let me down. But it is our responsibility. You understand that in a family relationship. You've got a brother or sister who's in drugs or doing something. What do you do? What does the family do? I'm talking about a, a, a I understand families can be dysfunctional. I'm talking about a family that has love for brothers and sisters that they ought to have. Well, what do they do? You don't just sit there and say, well, who cares? Let his life go in the commode. I don't care. 
No, you sit here and do what you can to pull the brother or sister out. Okay? You try to help them. That's what he's calling the church to do with regard to all of the members. He says, listen, you, you need to take these steps. And then he reinforces it. He reinforces that appeal by referring to Deuteronomy 29, 18 and to the story of Esau from Genesis 25 and 27. Now, it's easy to miss when he talks about this thing about let no root of bitterness springing up. Okay, he's referring to, to Moses in Deuteronomy 29, 18. In fact, most of the modern translations will give you a little footnote. If it's the NIV, the TNIV, the New American Standard, the English Standard, they'll all give a little footnote there and say Deuteronomy 29, 18. Okay, and it's even clearer in the Septuagint version that that's, he's referring to that. Okay, now what's he doing there? See, the, 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 he tells them you need to take these steps. To be careful, he reinforces that by referring to Deuteronomy 29, 18 in the case of Esau and the exhortation for them to take care that no bitter root springs up causing trouble and defiling many. He points to that what Moses has said in 29, 18 and the bitter root in that context is the person who turns from the Lord to serve other gods. This is exactly what he's talking about. He's saying the community of faith needs to take steps to keep people from turning from the Lord so that they miss the grace of God. And what happens when they do that, you run the risk that they will defile others. They will have a deleterious effect on the faith of others. Okay, They will miss the grace of God and defile many. And so this is what he's urging him, telling him not, not to do that. He's telling the church to work to prevent that. Okay, their leaving not only will harm them, but it will bum out the people who were here. Okay, it will harm them, it will depress them, it will hurt their faith and wind up defiling them. See, and then, then we have the reference to Esau, and you have Esau, the intertestamental literature, okay, after the close of the Old Testament, you have intertestamental literature, the intertestamental literature had developed a picture of Esau as somebody who was sexually immoral for having married Hittite women. Okay, that's the thread that they ran with. And you see his marriage to Hittite women in Genesis 26, verse 34. But there, his reference here, now a number of people think that's what they're talking about, is that the writer of Hebrews is picking up on that intertestamental thread that had painted Esau as sexually immoral for having married Hittite women. But it seems uh, certainly possible that the reference to his being sexually immoral is here a metaphor for his being faithless. Okay, his being faithless. And the point is that Esau allowed something as insignificant as brief physical hunger, okay, to cause him to give up or to surrender something of great value, his inheritance right. Okay, here was a guy who made a really bad bargain. He comes in and he's hungry. Now, he may be really hungry, but he's only been out a day. I mean, you know, he says, oh, man, you know, okay. He winds up selling his inheritance right. He, he, he doesn't care about it. He winds up for something as petty as brief hunger, getting rid of his inheritance right. And the, the condemnation of Scripture is on him. It's not on his brother. You see, it's on him for treating something that valuable that shabbily. Okay, he winds up getting rid of it for something that is, that is uh, you know, insignificant. And the consequence of his choice, that consequence, it became irrevocable when Isaac blessed Jacob. He couldn't find a place for repentance. He couldn't find a way to undo that blessing that had been bestowed, even though he sought that with tears. And uh, Coaster, or George Guthrie says, the author of Hebrews wishes to drive home the point that only tears and rejection await those who sell out the inheritance that God promises to his children. You see, this is, I mean, this is a perfect parallel, what he's telling them. He says, if you allow yourself, for whatever reason, this stuff you're facing is relatively insignificant. And if you, like Esau, wind up selling your birthright for these things, you are going to be in the same position and there's not going to be any crying or weeping or anything that's going to alter it. And it reminded me of Luke chapter 13, where the owner of the house gets up and closes the door. And he says, then you got these people out here, you know, they're just you know, wailing, saying, hey, let us in. He says, you know, you, you taught in our streets, and we ate together. We had a passing familiarity. And he says to them, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. 
And there they, it just strikes me this same thing. Where, and this is what the Hebrew writer is telling them. You are playing with something very, very dangerous Okay, when you're doing this. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ have a duty to be involved in one another's lives, in the vernacular, to be up in one another's business. We have a duty to do that. And I know people don't like it. And that's part of why we, are, we don't fulfill that duty very well. Because when you come up and try to uh, find out what somebody's doing, find out about their spiritual lives, a lot of people get defensive and downright hostile. Even when elders are trying to discharge their God-given responsibility, and they're trying to find, who are you, the Gestapo? No, I'm somebody who has care for your soul, and I'm trying to help you. It is unspiritual to treat genuine acts of concern that way. Okay, to be a little porcupine and say, I got the idea. Anybody mess with me, I'll just blow them off. And I'll keep them from coming and asking so they can help me. And I just want to be this little isolated coal. Okay, it is our duty, our responsibility. And the church needs to grasp that. Now, I understand you can go crazy with that. Okay, I'm, I understand that. You can sit here and say, listen, uh, you know, I don't like the shirt you're wearing here. Okay, we're not talking about craziness like that, right? We're talking about helping one another spiritually to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, and we have a responsibility to that. Guthrie, in his commentary, he cites a letter uh, from the persecuted believers in Vienna and Lyon that was written to the churches in Asia and Phrygia. Now, this letter is dated A.D. 177. Okay, now we know about this letter because Eusebius who wrote in the early 4th century, he wrote the, the first history of the church, he quotes this letter in book 5 of his work. But I wanted to read to you this letter. Uh, they're talking about here, after praising the faith and strength of a martyr named Vettius. Here's what these Christians wrote in the 2nd century. Then the rest fell into two groups. It was clear that some were ready to be the first Gaelic martyrs, they made full confession of their testimony with great eagerness. It was equally, equally clear that others were not ready, that they had not been trained and were still flabby in no fit condition to face the strain of a struggle to the death. Of these, some ten proved stillborn. There were apparently ten people who had buckled under the pressure and had recanted and renounced Jesus Christ. Okay, ten proves, some ten proves stillborn, causing us great distress and inexpressible grief and damping the enthusiasm of those not yet arrested. However, in spite of the agonies they, meaning the martyrs, were suffering, these people, the unprepared, the flabby, not those that were stillborn, they came out of that group. He says, these people uh, stayed with the martyrs and did not desert them. But at the same time, we were all tormented by doubts about their confessing Christ. We were not afraid of the punishments inflicted, but looking to the outcome and dreading lest anyone might fall away. Now, i got to read to you what Guthrie says about this. I quote these things because Guthrie's comments here, to me, are really challenging. Okay, he says, The emotional grief and dread caused by the specter of apostasy in this ancient church, should cause us to pause for reflection. How do we respond to the apostasy of those from within our churches? Is there an intensity of grief and dread over this problem? If not, why not? What is there in our theological or cultural makeup that tempts us to accept apostasy as of minimal importance? Now, I don't know if that resonates with you, but every church I've been in has had people come and go, converted, fall away, and it's just like part of business as usual. And there is not this sense, because there is not a sense of community, what it needs to be when somebody falls away. And he goes on and he says, if you as an individual are struggling with following the example of Esau, treating God's promised inheritance as if it was of little consequence, have you stopped to consider the impact of that decision on those around you? Your close associates in the church, those in your Bible study, your spouse and closest friends, your children, your pastor, by that he means preacher, please stop and consider the curse of being one who introduces a bitter root to the church of the living God. 
In doing so, you not only affect yourself, but you also contaminate others in such a way that will mark your life and theirs forever. And I just see this thing about the church just so casual, about people falling. I'm sorry, what happened to them? They fell away. You know, in, out, who cares? Right? And I look at these, and they, and they just dreaded it. They were just, it killed them to see brothers and sisters in Christ. And now you can't stop everybody. I understand that. And sometimes you'll go and try to talk to people, you know, and they'll be really hostile and tell you to buzz off. But at least on that day, we as brothers and sisters will be able to stand before the Lord and say, you know that we pursued them. We cared about them. We didn't treat them as a, who cares? You know, we sought them. And I think that's a very important thing, and that's why I quoted that to you. I just think the church needs to hear a lot about that, and the church needs to grow in that. But part of that, see, is this idea of forging community and feeling toward one another instead of a rotary club idea that we kind of come in and just kind of, we occupy the same space for a little bit, but nobody has any call. On and let me tell you something. I think part of the reason uh, people are reluctant to get involved and do things is they fear that being involved grant somebody some purchase on them and some pull on them, and they don't want that. They want to just bop in, split. Come in, split. Because they don't want to be involved, because if somebody's involved, then that means somebody can call me up and say, hey, can you help me do this? Or how are you doing? Are you praying? Are you doing this? And I don't want that. Okay, but I'm telling you that when you say, I don't want that, you are saying something spiritually very significant. Okay? Spiritually very significant. Because, look, this Jesus thing is lock, stock, and barrel, right? It's, it's, it's the full deal. And I've used the example about revolutions, and I do it for a reason. Because our image of a revolutionary is somebody who is intent, passionate, lives for it. And that's Christ. You see, that's Christ. And we have to, we have to get on with that. Okay, chapter 12, verse 18 to 21, he says, For you have not come to a thing that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and to gloom, and to a storm, and to the noise of a trumpet, and to a sound of words, which those who heard begged that a word not be added to them, for they could not bear the thing commanded, if even an animal should touch the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, what appeared was so frightening, Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. See, turning from God always is inexcusable and tragic. But it's even more so in light of the glory of the new covenant. It's always inexcusable and tragic, but more so in light of the glory of the new covenant. See, Christians have not come to a covenant like the Mosaic covenant that is symbolized in the events at Sinai. He is using these events as a symbol to characterize the old covenant. We have not come to a covenant that is symbolized by the events at Sinai so emphasized God's distance, His fearsomeness, and the sternness of His commands. Now, the old covenant emphasized that because it was a tutor until the coming of the new covenant. It was teaching something in that. It emphasized that for a reason. But he's saying, listen, you haven't come to something like that. You've come to something greater. And he's going to describe that in a second. Now, this imagery is drawn from the covenant assembly that's recorded in Exodus 19 and 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now, for those of you who are thinking Moses is not reported in those texts in Exodus and Deuteronomy as having said, I'm terrified and I'm trembling. But here we have the Hebrew writer putting those words in his mouth. And what I think is going on, you see in Exodus 16, it says that all the people in the camp trembled. And the Hebrew writer, under inspiration from God, he makes clear that all the people included Moses. Okay, so this is a frightening scene here at Sinai. You know, and that's why I've, I've said before that cartoon years ago in the New Yorker that popped up, you know, and it just reflects our age, you know, our attitude of, uh, you know, this time, our culture, you got this guy sitting there in front of a mirror and he's straightening his tie. You know, kind of this suave look. He's going, prepare to meet thy God. You see this kind of flippant, uh, yeah, you know, it's just no, you know, I, I'm going in for an interview. You know, I'm going to prepare to meet thy God. Let me tell you, when they meet God, not going to be any straightening the tie. You know, like, yo, you know, what up, God? It's not going to be like that. Okay. It's not going to be like that at all. It's going to be face down, baby. 
face down. And so here you see this thing. You, you see the awesomeness of God. The Old Covenant is emphasizing this for a reason, but it's emphasizing His distance, His fearsomeness, and the sternness of His commands. But then we get this description of the New Covenant. He says, you haven't come to that. He says, but you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels in a joyful gathering into the church of the firstborn ones who are enrolled in the heavens and to the judge, the God of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See, the surpassing glory of the new covenant is expressed in its contrast with the Sinaitic symbolism of the old. Okay, so he characterizes the old by showing you its portrayal at Sinai. And then he contrasts the new by giving you this depiction of it. And the distance and the trepidation that is portrayed in the, of the old that's portrayed at Sinai, the, 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 you know, the distance and trepidation of the old covenant that's portrayed there. That frightening scene at Mount Sinai, it's given way to what? It's given way to the nearness, the warmth, the openness, and the celebration of the new. Do you see the picture contrast? Let me read to you what William Lane says. He says, every aspect of the vision provides encouragement for coming boldly into the presence of God. The atmosphere at Mount Zion is festive. The frightening visual imagery of blazing fire, darkness, and gloom fades before the reality of the city of the living, of, of God, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem. The cacophony of, of whirlwind, trumpet blast, and a sound of words is muted and replaced by the joyful praise of angels in a festal gathering. The trembling congregation of Israel gathered solemnly at the base of the mountain is superseded by the assembly of those whose names are permanently inscribed in the heavenly archives. An overwhelming impression of the unapproachability of God is eclipsed in the experience of full access to the presence of God and of Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And I think that describes it well. So this is a, uh, you know, I think that, that you see the contrast. See, those in the new covenant, the new covenant have been linked with the heavenly reality, with God's true dwelling place, and with its countless angels and joyful worship. We have been tied to that. We have been connected to that. They've been made part of and thus brought into a relationship with the church of the firstborn ones. And I translate that way because it's plural. Okay, the firstborn ones. The firstborn ones are those who share the inheritance of the Son who is the firstborn, right? That's how he's described in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. It's those who share the inheritance of the Son and whose names are written in heaven. They've come to the judge, the God of all. We've come to the, to the God of all who will vindicate us on that day and they've entered into fellowship with the godly men and women who already died. Those who in the intermediate state between death and resurrection are in God's immediate presence because of Christ. Okay, so we share in all this. See, we are here and part of this already. And of course, those in the new covenant have come to Jesus. He's the mediator of that covenant. And his blood, this line where it says here, I love this, where he says... Uh, I don't have the text up there, but his, his blood, it says it speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, now this is, this is powerful stuff. Christ's blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel because Abel's blood, what? It cried out for judgment. Right? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, Abel's blood cries out for judgment, bearing witness to Cain's guilt. That's what his blood's testifying to. It's crying out for judgment. Vindicate me. Punish and the blood of Jesus Christ has won our forgiveness. And what does it cry out? We are guilty no more. See, we are guilty no more. It speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus Christ. We are guilty no more. I'm looking here. i got about a minute. I think I'll go ahead and I'll read this. You know how I work it and I'll just stop when the bell rings. He says, see to it that you do not refuse the one who is speaking... For if those who refused the one who warned them on earth did not escape, how much less will we who turn away from the one who warns from the heavens, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more will I shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. 
Now the phrase yet once more makes clear the removal of the things that are shaken as of things that have been made so that the things that are not shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us have gratitude with which let us worship God in an acceptable way with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Now here we get the fifth warning in the book. In these, these sections of exhortation, you have a number of warnings uh, sprinkled through. And here is the fifth warning that we get in the book. And in light of all this that he's been saying, the writer is warning them not to turn from the Christian faith. See, the truth of Christ. This is, this is the thrust of the book. Right? He's, war- he's telling them not to turn. As Guthrie expresses the point, he says, if those of the old covenant did not escape the wrath of God when they turned from his word, the judgment on those who reject the message of salvation received in the new covenant era is even more certain. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So see, he's, he's urging and appealing. He's appealing to the people who are in danger of turning. And this is a message, as I've said many times, that we have to tell people. We have to tell them about the danger of turning what they're, what they're in jeopardy of doing. They're in jeopardy of just saying, listen, I'm going to turn because, you know, all the examples I've given in the past, you know, I I just don't want to live this way. It's too hard. My boyfriend's leaning on me. Whatever it is, my boss is after me. And he says, listen, that's a fool's move. You see, because you have to see the consequences of that. You have to see where that winds up uh, going. Okay, and he has a lot more to say here. I'll pick up uh, uh, next week. But uh, rather than launch off into that on what I think he means by all this shaking stuff, I'll just stop here. And I think the bell's going to ring because I can see the clock. Thank you for coming.